Okie doke, uh, we'll get started. We have a lot of territory to cover in a little bit of time today. So uh, welcome everyone to the Aging and Vision Loss National Coalition's part three of our transportation webinar series, Putting Mobility in Motion, the Potential, Promise and Pain of Public Transportation. And today's uh, webinar will focus on using partnerships and advocacy to get on the right track with accessible transportation. And I'd like to call on Anicio Correa, who is one of our tremendous leaders in the Aging and Vision Loss National Coalition uh, to give a few opening remarks for us. Thank you, Libby, and welcome everyone to this third web webinar on, the, on this three-part series. In the previous webinars, we uh, speakers spoke about how transportation is organized on a federal, state, local level, how funding works, and more importantly, perhaps how, how far partnerships and collaborations can go in, in uh, ensuring accessible transportation. I'm sure we all can agree that transportation plays a critical role in the independence of people who are blind and visually impaired, including older persons uh, with visual impairments. Today's webinar, the, thir the third in the, in the series, will focus on and will illustrate specific examples on a local level of these uh, partnerships and collaborations, and more importantly, advocacy. Uh, I want to on behalf of the, of the Aging and Vision Loss National Coalition, uh, the Aging, the Alliance on Aging and Vision Loss, I want to thank the speakers uh, for this webinar that Libby will be introduced. They'll be bringing both their expertise as well as in some cases their own personal experience. So we look forward to hearing and learning from them. If you missed any of the previous webinars, they are available on YouTube, on the AVLNC webpage. So please go back and listen to them. And let's take these lessons and put them into practice, all of us. Thank you. And back to you, Libby. Thank you. Thank you, Anicio. And I think one of the tremendous things about this particular webinar series is not only uh, the overview of the various uh, laws or regulations and that kind of thing, the different kinds of public transportation, but uh, that along with real world examples and uh, has, is a tremendous, has been a tremendous educational opportunity for me and uh, for many other people based on the uh, feedback that we're getting about this. So uh, if we can advance to uh, slide three, I'd like to introduce our, uh, to our partners today who will be speaking to, uh, speaking to us. And I'm gonna introduce in reverse order of, uh, the, of the speakers, uh, starting with the, uh, introducing the last speaker first who is Nicole Fincham Sheehan. She is a disability accessibility specialist with Palm Trans in Florida. And uh, we welcome Nicole and she has a, a wonderful presentation for you about what's working with Palm, uh, Palm Trans and her background in transportation. We also have Sarah Harris, who is director of programs um, at uh, Resources for Independence in Central Valley. She's lots of other things too. She and everybody, every single speaker has lots of other roles related to our field. Um, and so I'm just naming the first ones, but you'll learn more about every person as we go through. We also have uh, Frank Welty from California and he is a member and so much more with the Policy Advisory Council uh, of the San Francisco Bay Area Metropolitan Transportation Commission. And then um, we have Denise Jess, uh, who has returned to speak to us again. And she's the executive director of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired and um, has some more information to share with us as she has in the previous ones. So um, with that, I'll uh, ask Helen to advance to slide, five, uh, slide four, and uh, I'll toss it over to you, Denise. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Libby, and welcome, everybody. I am delighted to be back again um, to talk with you about uh, innovative partnership that we have uh, put together in Wisconsin uh, that has also taps into our advocacy efforts uh, on a regular basis. So before I launch into that, just a, a brief reminder of who I am. I am the executive director of the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired to my role, I bring the lived experience of uh, being legally blind since birth. I'm also a transportation advocacy nerd, um, proud of it. So I've been working in the advocacy world uh, in both individual and self-advocacy and also policy advocacy on the local and state level uh, for a good portion of my adult professional life. And transportation uh, equity is is one of the is one of my top passions. Um, I also serve on the City of Madison Transportation Commission. So get that down in the literally in the weeds experience um, on a regular basis around transportation equity. And I serve as the co-chair of the Wisconsin Non-Driver Advisory Committee. And Helen, we can advance the slide. So our focus for today with in my um, part of the presentation is to share uh, um, about the Wisconsin Non-Driver Advisory Committee. Um, with, and our mission in that committee is to develop uh, recommendations to improve transportation mobility, safety and access for all non-drivers. And our working definition of non-drivers includes older adults, and students, um, young kids who need to get from place to place and are transportation dependent on someone getting them there. Um, people with a variety of disabilities, including blindness and vision loss. Uh, folks who choose not to drive for a variety of reasons. And particularly a lot of our young adults are making active choices to not drive. And then folks who are unlicensed. So perhaps um, folks who are immigrant status or for other reasons, even though they have the ability to drive, do not hold a driver's license. And then um, folks who may be um, experiencing um, vehicle um, poverty, you know, so maybe there's more folks in the house who need an access to a vehicle than they have vehicles. So a very comprehensive definition of the non-driver. And we can advance. So to uh, talk about the non-driver advisory committee, I think it's really helpful to put um, a little context around Wisconsin. The non-driver advisory committee or WINDAC as we um, affectionately refer to it, serves the needs of the entire state. And Wisconsin is a big state. We take up certainly not as much geography as California, um, but we, we do take up a lot of space. So our population is about 6 million, just under. 18% um, of the folks living in our state are older adults, and we are seeing, uh, like many other parts of the country, that population continuing to uh, grow by leaps and bounds, much more uh, quick growth here than we see in our younger population and, um, and new births. 29% uh, of Wisconsin's uh, population are non-drivers. So the folks who fit in that definition that I just shared with you. And that to me, having one third of our population who does not drive is uh, very much worth noting in a state that is very um, car centric. Um, and then the last kind of fast fact I'll share with you is that 97% of our state is rural. Um, the map, there's a map that's on the right hand side of the slide and it shows uh, Wisconsin and um, there's just a few metropolitan areas, one very large one, the Milwaukee area and surrounding communities and then some medium sized ones. But a lot of our space is spread out out, um, and about 30% of our population lives in towns under 10,000 uh, people. We can go to the next slide. 
So some challenges that we face in Wisconsin um, are going to be familiar to many of us because they are not unique to Wisconsin, although there are a couple that are unique. Um, our services for transportation, other than driving a car, are very much uh, patchwork. There's a map on the right-hand side of the slide that shows our transportation, um, public transportation uh, services in the state, and there are big open spaces in the map that are not served by public entities um, and maybe even very poorly served by uh, volunteer driver services. So not being able to drive in the state means that you have very limited access to employment opportunities, health care, grocery stores, um, visiting friends and family. Um, it is very difficult in Wisconsin to travel across municipal um, lines. So if you live in one town or one suburb, and uh, work in another, you may not be able to get to work. And we certainly have folks um, in our constituency who have had to decline uh, jobs because they could not figure out how to cobble together uh, transportation. Um, and we, by law in the state of Wisconsin, are prohibited from having regional transit authorities. A lot of states have these. Wisconsin is atypical in not having the ability to raise revenue through tax levy um, and, you know, fun and pooling funding among municipalities to put together a more comprehensive network um, of transportation. And so that becomes really significantly challenging for cross -municip municipal transportation. And there are few available options, particularly in our rural communities for being able to get around the community itself, let alone get from community to community. And we can go to the next slide. We do have some shining stars, though, that I, I think are worth mentioning. Um, one is that we have a very robust mobility management network. Um, if you attended last week's webinar, you got to hear from uh, folks from the National Center for Mobility Management and then one of our own Wisconsin mobility managers to learn more about this really vital program that can help someone who needs transportation to figure out how to put together um, a series of rides and to make a trip possible. And they work creatively to braid funding together um, and look at where the transportation sources are to assist um, individuals with being able to get from place to place. So very proud of that network and grateful for the folks who do that work. Um, a couple of other things that are kind of st uh, stars in our sky and that we have some creative uh, workforce mobility transportation um, programs that certainly folks um, who are needing transportation period can use um, from getting from community to community. Um, and those are public private partnerships. And um, I applaud those because it's that public partner, um, public private partnership that can actually have more latitude to accomplish um, to accomplish great things. So there's uh, a pretty strong network called the Smart Bus that runs along the Mississippi River um, in the central part of the state to get people to and from communities, and then a tribal, local um, community partnership up in the very northern part of the state on the shores of Lake Superior that connects um, the, the uh, tribal reservation and um, some some of the towns so that folks have ability to move about. And then um, even though for those of us who use urban transportation every day, there may be lots of frustrations that we experience. All in all, our urban um, transportation fixed route system is um, in our various cities is, is, is a strong one and has a lot of positives. So let's move forward. So what is the um, what is the Wisconsin Non-Driver Advisory Committee? How are, how are we guided? Um, so I'll speak to the as one of the co-chairs, um, you know, meeting with my co-chairs initially, we wanted to develop some guiding assumptions that would steer us in our work, that we would make decisions based on, and that we would convey to our members so that we were shooting for, um, you know, 
shooting for important goals, not just kind of settling for um, moving the needle a tiny bit. So some of those um, guiding assumptions are that transportation insecurity is a systems problem. It is not an individual um, thing for the person who is the non-driver to, to bear. And that's often how it gets framed. You know, someone says, I can't get there and um, from here. And, you know, the response is often, oh, that's too bad. Have you called your daughter-in-law to give you a ride? And the burden and the problem are labeled with the non-driver. But we have so many system breakdowns that we need to understand that this is a systemic issue that's guided by policy and funding and lack of cooperation so that we can really start to get at the heart of the issue. Um, increasing transportation security is best is good for the whole community. So often, you know, it gets labeled again as an individual thing. Well, if the bus ran here, that would certainly help you out. But really, when we can get people from wh where they need to go so they can go about their activities of daily living, including work um, and health care, the whole community benefits economically and socially. Um, Non-drivers, this is, I think, a basic human right um, from our committee's um, viewpoint that non-drivers have the right to get to where we need to go, um, you know, on time and really with this, a similar kind of experience to what someone who's able to drive can do. And then lastly, that there are many entities and perspectives that can help um, solve the transportation uh, quandaries that we're living in. And we can advance. So the structure of WINDAC um, is that it's hosted by the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. So several years ago, um, myself and other, uh, trans other disability advocates and aging advocates saw the need for kind of a coordinating entity to help us really dig into and collaborate on uh, the transportation issues that we live with in this state. And we believed that if we were able to have a state agency be the host or the holder of that, that it would carry more clout, more visibility, more um, potential power for drawing people together. So we uh, approached the Secretary of the Department of Transportation under a couple different administrations proposing this idea. And we we then had a secretary in the current administration who saw the wisdom of it. And he'll often say, Denise, I'm so glad we had the wisdom to listen to you. So um, great. Thank you, Libby, for the time check. Um, so we approached um, the secretary and they uh, decided to form the non-driver advisory committee. And there are three of us that co-chair it. And this was also a remarkable thing because typically co-chairing by these advisory committees is done by someone from within the state agency. And um, Wistot saw the benefit of having myself as both someone with lived experience and an advocate, as well as another advocate co-chair, so that we are constantly um, working off those guiding assumptions that we just talked about. And then there are 46 members um, on the um, advisory committee from 40 different agencies and, and entities, and we can move forward. And those include um, representatives from any state agency that has transportation programs housed in it, local and county and um, state lawmakers, transportation providers, human service providers, mobility managers, advocates, and people with lived experience from the disability community, the aging community, tribal, um, the bike and ped um, uh, community, and folks who uh, work in the poverty world, and also um, folks who are involved in land use. And then we also have municipal and regional planning uh, representatives um, involved and, and business um, as well. So it's a really rich group of folks that comes together uh, twice a year for doing our work. And then the three co-chairs and our project um, manager meet every other week to keep the work moving forward between the large meetings. And we can go forward.
So we have um, been meeting for two years this June, and I, I, um, from my perspective, I think we have an impressive list of accomplishments. So one was to create a shared understanding among all committee members of the challenges um, and realities faced by non-drivers. So when we first came together two years ago, it was really clear that people came with their perceptions and their experience and often through a program filter and not really realizing what our piecemeal transportation system, what impact that had on us um, who couldn't drive on a day-to-day -day basis and how exhausting um, that can be for us to navigate. So we now have 46 really powerful advocates who will talk from the non-driver advise non-driver perspective when they are out in the communities doing their work. Um, one of the most powerful stories I heard recently was one of our regional planners who said to me, oh my gosh, you know what? I realized that when my planning commission comes together, and these are the people who decide where the hospitals are going to go and where the grocery stores are going to go and where the roads Roads are going to go. He's like, everybody drove up to the meeting in their car. None of us are non drivers. And we're making decisions about non drivers all the time. He's like, there's a big disconnect that I need to figure out how we how we don't continue to perpetuate. Um, one of our other accomplishments is uh, transportation metrics. Um, so a lot of the metrics or the um, the excellence points that you know that transportation providers are required to follow come from the um, Federal Transit Administration and the state. And a lot of them are programmatic um, and don't always put the non-drivers needs at the um, at the center. And so we have developed some um, pilot metrics that really attend to what's the experience like for someone who's a non-driver? You know, are they spending two hours on the bus? What's the acceptable amount of time on the bus? And we are piloting those metrics with 10 transit providers this year. And at the end of the year, we'll evaluate those. Um, how effective were they? How did they better the lives of non-drivers? And then look at what tools we have for implementing them on a wider scale. Um, one of our other accomplishments is developing an ARC GIS planning tool that shows people where in the state non-drivers are located. It uses census data and um, DMV, uh, Department of Motor Vehicle data, and really points out where the big pockets of non-drivers are. And planners can use this tool to go, okay, if we're going to put a hospital here, we've got people who would use the hospital, but they don't have a way to get there. Um, it also has really been a good media catch, a lot of interest, and we've done a lot of news people, uh, pieces on it to help raise awareness of non-drivers um, in the state of Wisconsin. And it's a great tool when we talk with legislators and lawmakers. Um, and uh, one of our other accomplishments is that we have been working with regional planners to put in planning benchmarks to be more inclusive of the needs of non-drivers as they are doing community design, including pedestrian facilities facilities. And we um, have state budget um, and statute recommendations, and we can provide to legislators a consistent message among all of these groups instead of many different messages about what our policy and budget asks are, especially as we enter into the next budget cycle starting in 2023. And we can move forward. Um, there are also these great opportunities that come because you didn't expect them. When you put advocates and people who care about things together in a collaborative setting, other cool things emerge. And so a couple that I want to highlight is that we have so much of a stronger relationship with, uh, with government organ, um, agencies, and we can leverage that to look at increasing DMV access so people can get the necessary ID for voting, um, that we're investigating how do we skip the trip on things. There's so much government business that people are expected to do in person, which could be done via phone or computer and save people 
having to arrange transportation to do those things. And we've also been using this as an opportunity to work on increasing accessibility of state websites for screen reader use. It just gives us another avenue to have these conversations. And then um, it gets me and uh, my colleagues in front of other transportation providers or folks who you know, want to know more about the specific um, unique needs of travelers with vision loss. And it gets us at tables where we didn't necessarily expect to be. So I just this week met with the folks who are designing the electrified vehicle uh, charging station network to talk about what are the accessibility needs of passengers who may be in um, electric vehicles when we're sitting at a charging station for an hour, including you know, the safety of service dogs. So all of these side benefits for advocacy, and we can advance. So last thing that I want to highlight before I um, end my presentation is that there's always lessons to be learned in these collaborations and, and to really take note of them and think about how do they apply as we move forward. So one is really embracing the complexity of transportation. Um, it, it is not an easy problem to fix. We've tried fixing it in easy ways. And in a lot of those easy, quote unquote, easy ways, we have broken transportation. So we have to be prepared to embrace the complexity and stick in this work for the long haul. Um, we need to uh, foster the potential of thinking, making decisions from the non-driver um, viewpoint. And when we do that, we actually create solutions that benefit um, the many. Um, it's essential to build um, shared understanding of these issues because otherwise they get shoved to the margins. Um, and we need to manage the dynamic tension that lives between, we need a solution now because real people are facing real challenges and we also need long-term solutions. So in our work, we've been looking at what is the low hanging fruit, you know, the quick wins and what are the things that we need to be doing for the next decade to keep this work moving. And to remember that while funding is certainly an issue and it will always be an issue, I believe that we should not throw up our hands in frustration um, because we're not getting ample funding, that we can figure out some creative solutions um, while we're advocating for funding, still finding creative solutions with the funding that we've got, and we can advance. So oh, go back one if you could. Thank you. So I'd love for you to visit us on the web. Um, I have been having some great conversations with folks who are like, we want to start a non-driver advisory committee in our state. Just met with folks from Washington State um, last week around this conversation. So you can visit the non-driver advisory committee um, on our website and see our agendas and our membership and some of our meeting notes and our charter. Um, and you can also also visit the ArcGIS tool and see how you can add layers to it to look at the non-drivers who are over a certain age, um, the non-drivers according to race or gender. And then you can plug in other data um, to see, um, you know, to make maps interface with each other where the transportation network is or isn't, where the hospitals are, et cetera. And, you know, I'd love to see an ArcGIS or similar tool in um, more and more states because I think it has so much potential. And now we can go to my last slide. And we would love for you to visit um, the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired through our various social media. We have a monthly e-newsletter that is completely focused on advocacy. And so if you're interested in joining that, we would love to have you subscribe. And now I'm really delighted to um, hear from my colleagues with their partnership um, projects, because I think those are going to be so exciting. And so I'm handing it off to Frank Welty with the San Francisco Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Thanks so much, everybody. Hello, everybody, and I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. And I'm going to be uh, overlapping somewhat with our last speaker, but uh, it, indefinitely in a g different geographic situation. Uh, in I am in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a region with somewhere around 8 million residents and uh, 
in the nine counties surrounding the San Francisco Bay here in California. So for the most part, it's a highly uh, urbanized area cl clustering around three very large cities, San Francisco, Oakland, and San Jose, uh, as well as a, a, very, a small amount of less urban area surrounding that. And then we have, uh, again, with nine counties, I, I noticed that the, the statistics about 46 uh, transit uh, entities in Wisconsin, uh, the Bay Area has 27 transit agencies just in those nine counties. So it's a very highly balkanized complex system. So I wanna talk about that a little bit, but I wanna focus on three main points. The point, point number one is that 85% of success is just showing up. Point number two is that if you're not sitting at the table, you're on the menu. Point number three is we are responsible for ourselves, but we are not responsible by ourselves. Now, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, uh, the Bay Area transit system is highly complex and highly balkanized. Uh, we have various train systems from the, the uh, Bay Area Rapid Transit System, which is, I'd say, the backbone of the region's transit system. Uh, and then we also have commuter rail systems that, that support that. And then we have uh, smaller light rails and, even, and even, even a subway system in the case of the San Francisco city itself. And then we have lots and lots and lots of buses. And we have ferries that uh, connect various places around the Bay to each other. Very complex system. And again, with a lot of different agencies that administer various parts of that system. And then loosely coordinating all of that is a regional body that is known as the Metropolitan Transportation Commission or MTC. And that Transportation Commission has a number of supporting advisory bodies of which the Policy Advisory Council is one which I happen to sit on. And it has a subcommittee, the Equity and Access uh, Subcommittee that I also sit on. Uh, so I think the first message is that 85% of, of success is just showing up. While it's a challenge dealing with such a complex system, the opportunity that it poses is to provide a lot of chances for us to have input. Uh, the various agencies usually have some kind of a, either a, a uh, consumer advisor committee or hopefully also a disability advisory committee of some some sort. Um, each of the public, uh, each of the paratransit services, which which uh, which mir somewhat mirror the fixed route transit in the area, are uh, also have their own uh, of what they usually call a paratransit coordinating council where people can give their feedback. And there are others as well. So there are lots of opportunities for us as people with disabilities to be able to get that seat at the table. So I think our first job is to actually be there so that if uh, your, your local disability community groups aren't already active on those various advisory committees, then you should certainly be there. Also, most of these agencies have a, a public board that has have regular board meetings. So we should be attending those. And then finally, of course, our various local and county governments have their city councils and boards of supervisors where we should be showing up, uh, letting them see us, uh, presenting our concerns during public comment so that we have a voice in the situation. I talked earlier about the idea of that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, earlier this year, or actually it was late last year, the, uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission came out with its, its uh, latest long range transportation command. They do this uh, transportation plan. They do this about once every 10 years. And this one is called Plan Bay Area 2050. It's a wonderful 100 page plus document with lots of graphs and charts and, and verbiage and 35 strategies that when followed will make, will show how our transportation systems are going to make the Bay Area, Bay Area a much letter, a much better place to live, except that if you're a person with a disability, the plan has almost nothing there for you directly. Um, there are a few places where they'll, they'll say things like, our plan includes the concerns of, of the elderly, of people with, uh, of uh, 
of the of the economically disadvantaged, of racial minorities, of environmental conserves. Oh yes, and people with disabilities, and that's about as detailed as they get. Clearly, when this plan was created at the table where this plan was created, we were not sitting at that table, and so we became part of the menu. That was a lesson learned. Uh, now understand that people with disabilities have been advocating for our rights in transportation in the Bay Area for many, many years. After all, the Bay Area can probably be argued to be both the, uh, the birthplace of the blindness movement and then later on the birthplace of the disability rights movement in the 1970s. And so we're no strangers to advocating for our concerns, but clearly there's room for more involvement. Uh, moving along, I think that the greatest lesson that we learned from this last experience was that along that, that not only do we need to be more active at being involved in these various advisory groups that are out there, but we also need to have, be more active in communicating and, and expressing our concerns to, to other stakeholders. Uh, so we're working hard on getting involved with various uh, advocacy groups that advocate on transportation, whether that's groups with, uh, with, con con with environmental concerns, uh, groups that bring together organized labor or business or, or uh, economically disadvantaged folks or uh, groups representing uh, minorities of various kinds. And we have learned that it's important for us to have a seat at those tables as well, so that when they're putting together their particular positions and th that they're going to be advocating for with the powers that be, that they include our concerns as well. And uh, that's where we're putting a lot of our effort. And that's why I say that we are responsible for ourselves, but we're not responsible by ourselves. So it's very important for all of us to uh, build those alliances with other stakeholders, not, not just the official government bodies that oversee our transit system, but also with the, the uh, individuals, groups, and organizations that are stakeholders in the transit system. And so again, my, my final three messages are that 85% of success is just showing up. If you're not sitting at the table, you're on the menu and we are responsible for ourselves, but we're not responsible by ourselves. And so I guess we can move on to Sarah. All right, everyone. Hello. Thank you, Frank. And thank you, Denise. So um, my name is Sarah Harris. I'm the Director of Programs at Resources for Independent Central Valley, which is the Center for Independent Living that covers five counties in the Central Valley of California. Um, and then I'm also the first Vice President of the California Council of the Blind. And I like to joke, you know, I also go by the lady who wears lots of hats um, and they're all sparkly. Um, my journey within advocacy for transportation started around 2015, and, it, and it's, it's been a really interesting journey in the, in the sense of um, I felt like I became an accidental advocate. <laughs> so um, my daughter, who was very small at the time, we, uh, we spent a lot of time on paratransit. She was a dancer. We had the grocery store. There were days where I was on, you know, six or seven rides um, in one day for paratransit. And I realized that there were parts of the system that were broken. And somebody told me there's these meetings that they have, the Disability Advisory Commission, you know, held downtown at City Hall here in the city of Fresno. And I was like, oh, let's go check it out. So my friend and I and a couple of other members from our local CCB chapter, we started going to these meetings. And you know, I just started listening and then I heard there was a transportation subcommittee and I'm like, well, let's go to those too. Let's go see what they have going on. And as time went on, you know, I realized that we were making a difference by being in that room um, and also by, you know, just stating the facts because a lot of times the folks that put together all the transportation, they're not the people who write it, right? Like we are. And so it's important for us to take the time to tell our story as well. Um, and then there became a time where, guess what? 
there was an opening on the transportation subcommittee. So I was like, well, how does that work? And so I asked our ADA coordinator and she's like, oh, you just, you know, ask to be appointed and, you know, you kind of give reasons why you would be, you know, helpful there. And so, you know, as Shirley Chisholm said, if there's not a seat at the table, you bring a folding chair. Um, and I think that's going to be our theme is making sure that you um, solidify your seat at the table, um, whether it be virtual or in person, it doesn't matter, your voice counts. Um, so I started serving on the subcommittee in 2016. Um, from that, we were able to build incredible relationships with the folks here in the city of Fresno who um, make the, the decisions within transportation um, we have helped with ensuring that the kiosk, um, the ticket vending machines, that they are accessible. We were able to help out with making sure that the new paratransit provider was going to work well um, for us and our environment, um, and and so on and so on. So we had, in a sense made people realize how important our opinions were and our stories were. And we were able to create this network of, of people and allies that were on our side when it came to transportation needs. And so going on and on, we uh, it's been a few years now that I've been sitting on the committee. Sometimes I look back and I go, where did time go, right? And back in July or June of last year, there was an, an ask, oh, by the way, they would like somebody from this committee to sit on the Measure C committee. And so Measure C is our budget, um, I'm sorry, our ballot measure that um, helps to fund transportation throughout the whole county. And so I was like, oh, I'll do it. And what I learned is, has been incredible. I was able to network with people, not only within our urban area, but within our rural area as well. And so I was able to make those connections and teach people about what some of the challenges that we have as people with disabilities and especially myself as a person who is blind with transportation in our area. Um, from this uh, commitment and from this time that I've spent um, on this committee, I've been able to really take the time to not only share my story, but to get to know their stories as well and kind of look at how we can work together to understand the back, you know, the back end of things is not always exactly what we assume it to be. Um, and so we're able to work together and find compromise within a system that a lot of times is a little bit broken, a lot broken, we never know, right? And especially right now, transportation is a little scary because we're having issues all across the board. And so currently one of my next steps that I really wanna look into is how I can better help um, our folks who run our rural transit agency, not only in um, bettering transportation for, for people with disabilities, but also taking the time to help with the outreach and to spread the word that there is transportation out in the universe and that you know, folks who suddenly will say like, oh, but there's nothing for me. Um, number one key is, is education and making sure that you're informed of what's available to you and what's around you and really helping um, others within our community to be able to find that information easily um, is one of my next steps and one of my, my hopes for the future um, as well. And so if anything that you get from you know, the four of us today, I think it's gonna be you know, make sure that, you know, you don't just sit behind and complain and complain and complain to yourself and to your friends. If there's something going on that's a concern, you know, go forth and give that complaint. Complaints are important, but also give compliments, you know, as well. But remember that unless you actually tell the powers that be, they don't know that there's a problem. So make sure that you establish those relationships and you, bring your folding chair to the table. Thank you. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on over to Nicole. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Nicole Fincham Sheehan and great presentations, Denise, Frank, and Sarah. I, I love what 
uh, Frank and Sarah have to say about being at the table, and they're definitely right. Um, I have over 20 years plus in the transit field. Um, at Like Sarah, I started out as an advocate uh, for myself to help improve paratransit and fixed route transit in Baltimore, Maryland, which is where I'm initially from. And then I realized that, you know what, I'm not the only pro person having problems here. And so I, I started advocating for those who couldn't speak up for themselves or who didn't know how to speak up for themselves. And I chaired, uh, started as a member on the MTA, the uh, Maryland Transit Administration's Citizens Advisory Committee for Accessible Transportation. And then I became the chair in 2014 and I helped to create and chair Disability Rights Maryland's Consumers for Accessible Ride Service uh, Committee. And so we, we, you know, joined forces with other agencies to, to help make transit better. My current position, I serve as the Disability Accessibility Specialist for Palm Tran. Palm Tran is the local transit agency that services Palm Beach County, Florida. And for those of you that are somewhat familiar with South Florida, uh, we are the largest county east of the Mississippi. So we serve as far north as the Jupiter Tequesta area, as far south as Boca Raton, as far east as the beach, and as far west as Belle Glade, South Bay, Pahokee, and Loxahatchee, uh, which are our extremely rural areas, which I will get into some of my presentation. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about accessibility and opportunity. And again, I'm from Palm Tran. Next slide, please. Palm Tran is celebrating its 51st year um, in transit in Palm Beach County. And we are comprised of fixed routes, paratransit and our Go Glade service. Our fixed route service, we have 150 buses that have um, two wheelchair securement systems on them and they operate 32 routes. Uh, one of the wheelchair securement systems that we have on 120 of our buses is called the quantum system. And this is an electronic way that individuals who use mobility devices and wheelchairs can secure themselves independently without having assistance from the driver. Next slide. For our, uh, like I said, we our fares, we have um, different discounted programs for our fixed route fares that our fares are two dollars but for students and individuals with disabilities and medicare they are you know discounted um and those who ride our paratransit service those fares are free if you choose to ride our fixed route service next slide please we also have on our fixed route a cashless way to pay it's called the paradise pass because of course if you're in palm beach county you are in paradise and so it's sunny and, and beautiful weather, pretty much 365 unless we're getting uh, a hurricane. But other than that, it's been pretty good weather. I'll take it over the, the snow up north. Um, but we have a Paradise Pass and this is our cashless way of paying for trips. It's a reloadable, usable card that you can reload money on or you can use an app on your phone and you can download the app and then you just uh, scan the QR code on your phone for the fare and it also gives you the cheapest fare on our fixed route so for example if you ride three times in one day that would technically be six dollars well it would cost five dollars for a day pass so that that third time that you ride it would only take a dollar off of your fare and then if you rode you know six times that day after that five dollars is paid the rest of your trips would be free next slide please uh palm train connection is our paratransit service. This is our door-to-door -door service that services individuals with disabilities. It costs two, um, excuse me, $3.50 per trip. And we are a lot, um, very unique in our paratransit program as most entities who service ADA paratransit do not go three quarters of a mile, generally past where their fixed route system ends. Here in Palm Beach County, you can go anywhere in the county you choose to go, um, and there's no limitations. We have a separate program that helps pick up the cost if you are outside of the ADA core service area, and this is called the Transportation Disadvantage Program. And the Transportation Disadvantage Program allows individuals who are not serviced by our fixed route area or our regular paratransit ADA corridor 
to still receive services and be able to travel within the Palm Beach County area. And they still only pay $3.50. And then other individuals who use our fixed route system who receive uh, influence from the TD program, meaning they qualify based upon their income. So their a regular monthly bus pass is $70. If they qualify for a fixed route bus pass, through the transportation disadvantage program, their bus pass is only $15 or $20, depending upon what their income is. And they would renew that application yearly. So the transportation disadvantage program is something that is unique to Florida and every jurisdiction in Florida operates differently when it comes to how they wanna run their, their TD funding, as it's known here. One other um, tidbit with uh, Palm Beach County that I, didn't, I missed in the beginning is, we have 39 municipalities within Palm Beach County, which means 39 cities uh, within Palm Beach County. And each city has its own city council individuals and their mayor. And then for the county, we have a board of county commissioners, which is comprised of a mayor, vice mayor, and then uh, five other uh, commissioners that represent each district. Next slide, please. This is our Go Glade service. Our Go Glade service launched in 2018, and it is an on-demand service, and our Go Glade service services the most rural part of Palm Beach County, and that is the Bell Glade area, Hokey, and South Bay. And as I mentioned earlier, this area is, is extremely rural, and so the on-demand service operates where individuals can call and say, I'd like a pickup at 2 p.m. to go to the grocery store and they would get that 2 p.m. pickup, they pay the same price they would pay if they would ride the regular fixed route buses. So if you are a paratransit rider, you would just show your ID and you would not pay anything. If you, you know, ride the fixed route, then it would be $2 for each trip that you would, you would take unless you have a Paradise Pass. We also do have some of our fixed route service that services our Glades um, area, Glades, Pahokee, and South Bay. We have one bus that services all three cities and it just services those three cities. And then we have another bus line that would bring individuals from those three areas into the city of West Palm Beach so that they can get into the city limits if they had to work, go to doctor's appointments, things of that nature. Our, our Go Glade service itself is we use the vehicles that are about the size of our paratransit vehicles. And again, it's an on-demand service. So some people may say, okay, I'm gonna take Go Glades, but then if they call to get a ride and they wanna go now and they say, well, we don't have anything that can come get you, you know, until 45 minutes, then at that point, they may just decide to take the bus that services that jurisdiction, which is the 47 bus. Next slide, please. This slide talks about some fixed route advantages. Our fixed route is one of the few in the country that is 100% ADA compliant. So as I mentioned, every bus has two uh, wheelchair or mobility device securements. They're either the manual tie-down system and the quantum system, 130 of them. And then on the remaining 20 is two manual tie-down wheelchair uh, securement areas. We have audio and visual signs on every bus. In addition, every bus kneels at a pickup of individuals. And if the person needs the ramp, they can extend the ramp. Also using fixed route, it's a spur of the moment service. So if you decide today, oh, it's a nice day, I wanna go out, you can do that with not having to schedule rides you know, ahead of time. Next slide, please. I call this one our, our toolkit, our rider's toolkit. So you can have a trip planner that you can you know, plan your trips accordingly. We have uh, QR codes at all of our bus stops. So you can go to the bus stop and scan the QR code and it'll tell you when the bus is coming. We have alert subscriptions. We have a Palm Tran app. In addition, we have the real-time scheduling. And these are just some examples for our fixed job. For our paratransit service, we also use PassWeb, which allows individuals to schedule their rides, cancel their rides, or even check the estimated time of arrival for their rides and it is fully accessible. Next slide, please. And other transit options that we have here in Palm Beach County, we have Amtrak, we have Greyhound, 
and we have tri-rail and they are at the intermodal station which is in the downtown west palm beach which is serviced and one of our layover points for our fixed route buses but it allows you to be able to travel to other counties and other areas of the state and with amtrak and greyhound of course other parts of the country in addition we have in boca raton an area set up where you can transfer to the Broward County transit system. And for those of you that are not familiar with Broward County by name, the Fort Lauderdale area, Pompano Beach area, you can transfer to their paratransit system or their fixed route system. And then further south in their county, there's another transfer point where you can transfer to Miami-Dade transit for individuals who are using paratransit or fixed route. So we've tried to make in partnership South Florida, you know, very accessible and feasible for those who want to travel. In addition, we have, which I didn't put on the slide, Brightline. And right now, Brightline services from Miami to West Palm Beach. But within the next year or two, it's going to service from Miami to Orlando, Florida. So that's going to make a lot of travel easier up into Central Florida. And Brightline is similar to Amtrak, Excel Express, for those of you who are familiar with the Northeast Corridor of Amtrak. And so it makes it you know, a lot easier and a lot more accessible, you know, for individuals to be able to travel and get where they, they need to go. And so that covers a little bit about what we do here in Palm Beach County. Like I said, our, our Go Glades is our most recent project that we are, you know, very proud of. And with the pandemic, it's been kind of interesting where most transit agencies and even us on our paratransit and our regular fixed route have saw significant decreases because of the pandemic in transit and in people riding, our Gold Glades is up over 50% from when we started in 2018. So that seems to be the mode of transit that everyone seems to want to travel with the pandemic and, and being able to get around. And so we, we're, we're very proud of that. And for that area, it's, it's a huge benefit because a lot of people out there are our underserved population and are on the lower socioeconomic level, you know, financially. So it's it's a nice resource for them to be able to have public transit in an area that otherwise it may not get that much access. And so, you know, we also encourage individuals, as Sarah mentioned, to be a part of our service board. We do have the Palm Trans Service Board, which is open to individuals and community members. And we have an elected official that sits on that board. We also have the Palm Tran uh, subcommittee of paratransit. And these are individuals that ride paratransit that advise us on things that are going wrong with paratransit or changes that they would like to see. And we also use them when we want to beta test. When we were beta testing the past web, we reached out to those clients, especially the blind and visually impaired population, so that we could make sure that it was accessible for all to use, but especially those using screen readers. And most recently, we've been uh, testing the PassWeb app, and it's with uh, version 20 of Trapeze. For those of you that are familiar with Trapeze, that's the scheduling system that we use. And it's, it's hit and miss on some accessibility features when it comes to the blind community, but we've been testing that to ensure that the app would be you know, much more accurate than what you can get on PassWeb. But PassWeb is still great because you can follow the bus and it will give you an accurate ETA of when the vehicle is going to arrive. And it works really well for us with our students. We serve a huge uh, student population in Palm Beach County. If a student goes to a charter school, they do not qualify to receive transportation from the district. So we service a huge student population. And so it comes in handy for the parents to be able to check to see when their student was picked up and then when their student would be arriving at home. Uh, and also a side note, I am legally blind. Um, I use the terminology blind. Um, I'm the first blind employee to be hired here at Palm Tran and in Palm Beach County. And so it's, it's sad and exciting at the same time that we're coming up on the 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, you know, I'm the first blind employee to be hired here. But it also shows that they're willing to look past the disability and look at the qualifications and experience that I can bring to the table. So at this point, I thank you and I will turn it over to Libby. 
Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, Nicole, and thank you to every one of our speakers, Denise, Frank, Sarah, Nicole, you all had such tremendous uh, advice and examples to give us. And I'm sure it's generating more, uh, more questions, more conversation. So at this time, I'd like to encourage people, if you do have questions, please type it into the Q&A box as uh, several of you have already done. And um, what we'll do is just read out the question and then any or all of our speakers uh, can help contribute to the answers for that. Real quickly, I want to let you know that this webinar is being, has been recorded. It will be forwarded, a link to it will be forwarded to everyone who registered for the webinar and it will be posted on Vision Serve Alliance's YouTube channel uh, for your viewing pleasure. And feel free to share it with others. We will also send out the slide deck to those who uh, registered for, uh, for the webinar. So uh, with that, I'll move on to reading the questions. And again, our, um, I appreciate all of our speakers being willing to share their time and expertise. So our, our first question is from Misty. And her uh, question is, I think another point for the powers that be to realize is that public transportation is better for the environment. The fewer people driving, the better it is for the environment. Any thoughts on this and how this argument can forward arguments for better public transport? Libby, this is Denise. I'm happy to kick it off if that's okay with everybody. Thank you. Yeah, Please. it is really critical to involve our um, environmental allies um, because they, they bring another very important perspective to the table. So in the transportation advocacy work that we do, um, both with the non-driver advisory committee, but also the coalition for more accessible transportation of which my organization is also um, a leader, um, environmental organizations and advocates are right there at the table um, because we know that um, all the pollutants and things that come from um, exhaust um, lead to issues like asthma and respiratory disease. So it has huge health impacts. So, um, uh, you know, helping people really connect the dots and that things are in interconnected in ways that we need to pay attention. So if we reduce the amount of vehicles on the road, we benefit um, our communities, particularly um, our marginalized folks who are living in tight urban areas we reduce um, clogging and waiting um, for you know, transportation to move along because the roadways are less congested. So yeah, bringing our environmental um, allies to the table definitely is critical for this conversation. And Nicole, and I was going to say, and definitely, you know, with, with gas prices so high right now, it, it's almost tri transit. We had dumped the pump day a few weeks ago and you know, being able to to get individuals to give transit a try and see that it, you know, it's it's not as bad as what you think it is. Um, you know, it runs pretty smoothly. You know, you don't have to worry about the hassles of finding a parking spot and, and things of that nature. And our new facility that we just opened up last year, we're in the process of acquiring some electric buses. So we actually have some electric charging stations over mm -hmm. there. So we will be putting some of our, our new fixed route buses will be, be the electric buses. And, and this is Sarah really quickly. I, I do believe that as we kind of move into uh, this new world that we're in, there's going to be more incentive out there for folks to not drive. And, and so I think that um, there's going to be more allies as we move into this new world where a lot more folks ride public transportation. Um, so I think that's something for us to be prepared for and, um, and also be excited about. This is Frank, and I just want to add to that, that I think another aspect of this is that especially if we are in a region that doesn't have a strong tradition of public transportation, and that is very car centric, is that I think in part, part of our messaging should be that even if the, per, that, that if the public doesn't think of themselves as interested in transit for themselves, that the, the presence of a strong, robust transit system is an engine of economic growth in terms of mm -hmm. it allows people to get mm -hmm. the jobs, which means that their, their 
they're able to be self-sustaining, they become, they become taxpayers. Mm -hmm. um, also transit makes uh, the community more um, appealing to businesses mm -hmm. because businesses like to go to places that have a good infrastructure. So I think that's a big message, especially again, if you're in an area that doesn't have a long tradition of support for public transportation. Thank you everyone for your comments there. Um, and we will move on to the next question. Uh, we do have time uh, for a robust discussion, so do not hesitate. If you're having difficulty entering questions into the Q&A uh, box, then please enter it in the chat. We already have a couple more questions in the chat and we'll get to those in just a moment. Uh, our next question is from an anonymous attendee asking are there any areas that have expanded special transportation out of the three quarter of a mile radius as prescribed and prescribed as in air quotes uh, by the ada nicole Ooh, we oh go ahead sorry mm -hmm. i was gonna say we have in in palm beach um like i said earlier we service the entire county um which is extremely large like i said we are the largest county east of the mississippi and so Regardless if you receive fixed route service in your neighborhood or not, you still can qualify for our ADA paratransit system. And so we partner with our TD program to help subsequent that funding that you otherwise would not, you know, have in order to use that ride outside of the ADA service. But, you know, many jurisdictions don't unless they have other programs, you know, in place. But here in Palm Beach County, you don't have to worry about where you live because if you qualify for paratransit, you'll you'll be picked up with no problem. One of the things I this is Denise, one of the things I mentioned early on about Wisconsin is that we do not have um, by statute, we can are not allowed to do um, um, RTAs, you know, regional transit authorities. And the, one of the benefits of an RTA is it allows for um, greater travel distances outside um, municipal boundaries. So for example, in our community, the paratransit has to stop at the, um, at the city lines. And um, so there are, there are some movements in some states to also revoke the um, regional transit authorities. I don't know which ones they are in the moment, but I've, I've heard over the course of time that there's interest in that. So this is one of the places to stay really aware of what's happening on the transportation level in your state legislature, because I can tell you that losing RTAs for Wisconsin has had had um, very negative impact on our ability to do better transportation beyond um, beyond city and town lines. So stay stay keep keep abreast of what's happening in your state legislature. And this is Sarah. Um, I just want to jump in about uh, here, here in Fresno. This is something that we've been very fortunate about. Is um, if there is a need. Um, they will look at it and assess the need and see if um, it makes sense to expand outside of that three quarter of a mile radius. And I'm very fortunate because where I live, it's um, one of those very interesting places where we're like the suburbia of the country where you look at my neighborhood, it looks very much like a traditional suburban neighborhood, but down the street, um, you'll see goats for sale. Uh, the closest fixed route bus stop is two miles away. Um, and so, you know, that's really a show of, of excellence on the part of our local transit system for thinking about the fact that, you know, we do have individuals that need um, transportation. There's also been partnerships um, with uh, other transportation agencies to um, work with. We have a veterans um, home that's way out in a rural area. Well, they made sure that um, they work together to get them a shuttle, you know, that comes um, into downtown Fresno um, every day, several times a day. Um, and so there's been a lot of really creative ways that they've been able to um, increase that access outside of that three quarter mile range. So it's doable. Um, it's, it's just dependent on your local area. And again, advocacy, you tell people what you need. If you don't tell them, then they won't know. Okay, any other comments? 
Okay, thank you very much uh, for that contribution to the conversation. And we do have a couple of people in the chat uh, who have, uh, I'd like to uh, read out this comment. Many of you or all of you may have already uh, read this, but I'd uh, love to hear conversation about Doreen Holmes's comment. She's from Rhode Island and she says, we have the RIDE, R-I-D-E, all in caps program. It's $4 one way. The big city buses have the card that you can load, but not ride. Um, the tickets of cash, you have to live three quarters of a mile from the big city bus ride route. Many people do not and are not eligible. We have a flex bus that will take them to the eligible place, but it only runs every hour, which is not convenient. We brought these issues to the state house and are waiting to hear. Do y'all uh, have any, and this, please understand that uh, at this point we're asking uh, anyone who would like to, all of our panelists, and we also have some si silent panelists who um, may want to contribute to the conversation as well, so. And th this is Sarah, I just want to really say that number one is collect stories, um, testimonies, um, really kind of, I think, they, they tell um, the powers that be, the folks that make the decisions, really what's happening. And so the more um, stories that you can collect, um, and especially compelling ones of why there is a need for something better can really make a difference. It'll take time, but it will really help. This yeah, is this, Nicole. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I was gonna say that the stories and advocacy are great. And especially if you can meet with your state and local legislatures, uh, we have a thing here every year called Transportation Disadvantage Day in Tallahassee. And we take between 30 and 50 advocates to Tallahassee to meet our state legislatures, our, our uh, representatives and our senators. And in 2019, I was just a consultant for Palm Trans, so I wasn't a full-fledged employee. And I had just had my daughter and my daughter was literally five weeks old. And I went to Tallahassee for the day. And here's this you know, blind lady with the cane, carrying this literally brand new baby on her all day long. And it just, it gave them a chance to see that, you know, the funding that they, they sign up, you know, they sign over, they sign for, it's really given to real people who live, you know, real lives, you know, and it's not just, you know, the elderly people, you know, though they benefit as well, but it's, you know, young moms, it's, you know, it's people who are going to college, people who are going to work. And so, you know, it allows them to see that what they do in supporting the funding allows us to be active contributing members of society. And, you know, and I, I, I have, you know, three children and a daughter who's 23 that I raised as a single parent and a five and a half year old son and now a three and a half year old daughter. And, you know, for them to just, like I said, to see a brand new baby, it, it really went volumes with them to see that she came all the way from Palm Beach, which is like an eight hour drive to Tallahassee, uh, Florida, and, you know, just let them see, to see us. And so the more that you can advocate and bring other people to, you know, write letters, but also let them see the real human being. And again, let them know that the funding that they're signing for you, again, allows you to be an active contributing, you know, participant member in society. Thank you. Because hallelujah, we're not all going for a joy ride, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. We have places to be and people to talk to. <laughs> you know, one other, this, this is Denise, one other thing to leverage too is um, media. And, you know, we have um, um, gotten the opportunity to have a good amount of media and getting those of us with um, vision loss and other disabilities in front of reporters, um, really, really critical. And um, so if you're partnering with an organization that can do press release, you can have a media event um, of some sort, because not only do we need to uh, make impressions on legislators, when these issues show up in the um, 
mainstream media, then they um, they get attention of folks for whom would never think about what is it like to have to wait um, for a bus or miss a connection or miss a doctor's appointment because you're sitting in transit or waiting for your ride. You know, that's just outside of the experience of so many folks and folks vote and, you know, and um, help influence. So really taking advantage of those media opportunities is really, really critical. Yeah, this is Nancy Miller. Um, I'm from Visions in New York City, and we serve the New York, New Jersey area. Um, And I, I would just really emphasize the opportunity for on demand for in many cases, the on demand service has been filling the gap of what can't be filled by the fixed route or by the paratransit system. Um, But it's complicated because transportation is complicated as (laughs) one of our our speakers said. (laughs) I I do wanna um, say that for the 35 years that I've been the CEO, transportation has never been the number one priority in disability conversations. And until we speak as one voice Mm -hmm. about transportation Mm -hmm. being the key that often unlocks work, unlocks independence, unlocks all of the other um, day-to-day issues Mm -hmm. that we have to raise awareness that transportation often is a solution to many other problems. One of the ways that we were doing it in New York is we now have a state chief disability officer. And the first meeting that I had with her as an advocate was, let's talk about transportation. Mm -hmm. Because as good And as frustrating, but as good as transportation is in New York City, there are still transportation deserts. And once you get outside of New York City, even in some of the very high density suburbs, the transportation is awful. So making sure that you're not only your legislators, but within your governor's office, within the Mm -hmm. state structure, that people who are advocating on behalf of people with disabilities, on behalf of older adults, on behalf of other high percentage non-driver groups, that they have transportation at the top of their list. Yes, and especially for blind and visually impaired people, transportation is the biggest barrier for us to do anything uh, because we don't drive. So in order for us to to go buy groceries, we need transportation. To go to the doctor, we need transportation. And so that's the biggest barrier for for individuals who are blind and visually impaired. Thank you everyone for for that discussion. And we'll move on as we have other questions. Uh, Chris Rogers would like uh, for Nicole to Uh, expand on the transportation disadvantage program in Florida. Could you tell us a little more about that, Nicole, please? So the transportation disadvantage program in Florida is set up with a trust. And we have a transportation disadvantage commission, which are individuals that are appointed by the governor. And it, it used to be where there was equal representation throughout the state. Uh, but over the last few years, some, some people have, have passed on and they haven't appointed some seats. So it's not fully comprised right now, but the Transportation Disadvantage Program serves individuals who are low income or who live in rural areas. And it gives them access to transportation via you know, discounted bus passes. Like I mentioned, we, we, our bus passes are $70 a month. If you are a Transportation Disadvantage customer, and you've been approved through that program, you only pay $15 or $20 for for your bus pass for the month. If you live in the rural suburbs of Loxahatchee or Pahokee or Belle Glade or South Bay, where there isn't any transit because there are parts out there where there technically wouldn't be transportation, 
with the transportation disadvantage program, you can be picked up and taken in town. And so that program isn't just for people with disabilities. It covers people with disabilities, but it also covers individuals who are low income, who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford to take transit everywhere they need to go. And so it allows them to take our paratransit service, for example, if they live in South Bay, and then we could take them all the way to Boca Raton if they had to go there to see a, a medical doctor, for example. And they would only pay $350, where that trip may cost $42. The rest of it would be subsidized through the, uh, through the TV program. Hello, Nancy Miller. I'm sorry, Nicole, and, and, uh, did I'm you have an opportunity I'm, to finish? <laughs> Um, I, I did, and it, it's a complicated program, but that's kind of the, the summary of it. Um, and each, like I said, each county in Florida ha has its own way of funding the TD program or how they want to spend the funds. I will say in Palm Beach County, once we have spent our TD funding on those trips, for example, say from South Bay to Boca Raton, we still provide transportation and we just use other funding to, to provide transportation where some jurisdictions in Florida, once they run out of funding, say they run out of funding, you know, July 15th, well, you can't have another trip until October 1st uh, when the new state funding starts, but we, we don't do that in Palm Beach County. So I, Palm Beach County, it can spoil a lot of people and it, it kind of takes you out of reality to a degree when you're using transit here. And then when you go other places, you get that wake up call of like, oh, oh my God, this is what it's really like. And so it's, 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 it is it is it is paradise to a degree when it comes to using transit here. I, w I will admit that with my work around the country and coming from the Baltimore DC area, it's, it's, it's totally different. When I go home to visit, I have to have a different mindset of what I'm going to get when I get off the airplane. Well, great. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, we do have several more questions in the chat function. However, we're closing in on the end of our time together. So what I will do with the remaining questions is that we will uh, transmit those to our panelists and then uh, they will uh, then they can respond to you either individually or collectively to the group because uh, there are truly good, more good uh, questions. Clearly more conversation needs to be had. So again, um, just want to remind you that the session is recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube channel. The recording and the slide deck will be emailed to all registrants for uh, this uh, third webinar. And as I mentioned earlier, there are just so many more great questions that need answers, and we all need to work together uh, nationwide to address this issue. And so for that reason, um, if you would like to contact any of our speakers today directly, there is uh, on your screen now is the slide that has uh, everyone's name, their affiliation, and their email address. When you receive the slide deck, the email addresses will be live links so that you can easily do that. We also would like to know if you would like to continue the conversation about transportation. We have more people who are approaching Vision Serve Alliance. We need some kind of forum, some kind of common gathering to discuss these issues and, and begin to help one another, uh, one another's communities and to advance our advocacy efforts throughout the country and at the federal level. So if you would like to participate in that, I encourage you to email me. And again, uh, the live link uh, will be there on the slide deck whenever you receive that but you can contact me at uh, lmurphy at visionservalliance.org. So once again, thank you all to all of our speakers for all three of our webinars and for today. They put in a lot of time and passion to present uh, this webinar to you. We appreciate your passion for the topic and for attending. 
and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful and safe July 4th holiday weekend. Thank you. Happy Wednesday. Thank you. Yes.